Okay, here we go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Moses, president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. LESPI and the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, our sister organization, are very happy to welcome you to our virtual book talk uh, on America's first freedom rider, Elizabeth Jennings, Chester A. Arthur, and the early fight for civil rights, presented by author Derry Micarenda and Courtney Bowie. For those of you not familiar with Lesby, we're a grassroots not-for-profit organization founded in 2007 and dedicated to the preservation of the historic Lower East Side, which includes the East Village, Lower East Side below Chinatown, I mean, Lower East Side below Houston Street, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. This area is one of the most historic areas of the city, country, and arguably the world. As a center for Im immigration into the United States, uh, starting around 200 years ago, as well as its role as an incubator uh, of widely influential artistic, cultural, and political movements, including the struggle for civil rights that you're gonna hear about tonight. This is a history that continues to our present day. Lesbury's primary preservation strategy for saving the Lower East Side's rich history, historic architecture, and culture is landmark designation by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. We find this to be the only viable way to ensure the long-term protection of the area's irreplaceable historic streetscapes and historic individual sites. Before we start with the program, um, we're going to uh, take a quick poll uh, to see where everybody lives. Uh, don't worry, this is an anonymous poll and uh, it should only take a minute. Okay, I, we'll give it another 10 seconds and then uh, we'll wrap it up and we'll give you the results uh, at the end. Okay, thank you. So during the presentation, um, you'll be able to ask questions on Zoom's Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer all questions that you have uh, as best we can. Um, and uh, we won't uh, be able to answer questions until the end of the presentation. So please uh, go ahead and, and write down your questions and we'll get to them at the end. I'm now happy to introduce Phyllis Eckhaus, my fellow Lesby board member, who will introduce Courtney and, and uh, Jerry. Thank you. Hi, good evening. So part of, of landmarking is making history visible. I am so pleased that Lesby is sponsoring an event that makes the awesome Elizabeth Jennings and her activist family and community visible. Black Lives Matter. Indeed, we are enriched by the history that Jerry Micaranda has documented so beautifully. When we neither value nor acknowledge black lives, we are complicit in structural racism. We are also collectively impoverished. And we distort the truth. Jerry recounts, but does not dwell on Jennings private legacy, perhaps as admirable as her public one, a legacy that contradicts Daniel Patrick Moynihan's notorious 1960s put down of black families as, quote, a tangle of pathology, unquote. When Jennings' uh, fiance died, she took it upon herself to rescue three of his children from the Colored Orphans Asylum. One of these children was Desiderata Wright Gonzalez, the great-great-grandmother of my friend Courtney Bowie, whose family continues to honor Jennings. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Courtney, who will introduce Jerry. Thank you. Good evening. I'm pleased to introduce Jerry Micarenda. And I want to take a moment to explain why I'm so excited about his book and his presentation tonight. As described by my friend Phyllis, 
The legacy of Elizabeth Jennings has always been alive in my family. We owe Elizabeth Jennings a great debt because as you will see in chapter 14 of the book, if you get a chance to read it, and I hope that you do, Elizabeth Jennings became engaged to my third great grandfather after her husband and son passed away. My third great grandfather, Edward Wright, was an escaped slave from Alabama who had fled to Mexico and raised a family there. There he'd had eight children and uh, his wife had passed away uh, giving birth to his youngest child. After the Civil War, he immigrated back to the United States with his four youngest children, one of whom was my great-great-grandmother. He was starting a mahogany importing business and had to travel abroad in 1870, so he placed his four children in the what was then called the Colored Orphans Asylum in Manhattan. During his trip abroad, he passed away and word got back to his fiance, the hero, the heroine of this book, Elizabeth Jennings. Uh, when she learned of his death, she went to the orphanage and retrieved three of the teenagers who um, she then raised on her own uh, as family. And um, this act of charity completely changed the course of my family's history. And while we aren't related to Elizabeth Jennings by blood, we've honored her memory and her legacy ever since this, this selfless act. She's influenced how we define family, which is to say we define family very broadly. We value children, we value education like she did. We ensure that children are given an opportunity to learn regardless of whether they're in our immediate and nuclear family. And finally, we honor her by naming girls Elizabeth and using the middle name Elizabeth to this day, and we've done so for over a century. We use the middle name Elizabeth in every corner of a very, very large family. Um, to this day, among my first cousins and my sister, uh, we have several Elizabeths in the family. And it is done to honor Elizabeth Jennings and her selfless act. She was a brave, principled woman, and we strive to carry that legacy. That leads me to the main event tonight, um, and that is to introduce you to Jerry Micarenda. The author of this book stumbled across the story of Elizabeth Jennings, and like many, he had never heard of it. He rightfully thought that it was a story that needed to be told. As you can see, he kept working on it, and like the subject of the book, he persisted until the book was not only finished, the research was done, but the book was published. This tells you a little bit of something about the author. Um, also, like the subject of the book, he comes from good New York stock. He's a native New Yorker. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, and raised in Port Jefferson, Long Island. He is the recipient of the 2015 Highlights Foundation Scholarship and a Penn Syndicated Fiction Award. His short stories have appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle, Turbula, Amarillo Bay, and Gravel Magazine. His nonfiction credits include the New York Times, Newsday, and the Boston Herald. His history profiles appear in the 2010 Encyclopedia of New York City and on the Gotham Center's history blog. And finally, he has also appeared on the AHC program, What History Forgot. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce to you, Jerry Micarenda. Wow, thanks for that, that great uh, uh, introduction, uh, Courtney. And uh, you know, rather than just uh, read from my book, what I thought I would do is uh, but uh, what I thought I would do is talk about the world that she lived in and, and how it's changed ours today. And the important thing about today's date, July 16th, 2020, is uh, it's the 166th anniversary of the altercation that, that really uh, changed the civil rights world here in New York City. So who was Elizabeth Jennings? She was a New York City school teacher, an early feminist, a civil rights advocate, and I'd say a badass rebel woman. Her contributions have been largely forgotten along with the importance of this era in American history and New York City's role in it. Many things have conspired to keep this story a secret until now. Some things you might not know about her family. Elizabeth's father was the first African American to receive a US patent. Young Chester Arthur was her trial attorney. Her mother and sisters were uh, members of a literary society that raised money to free slaves. Her abolitionist brothers were friends with Frederick Douglass and William Nell up in Boston. Elizabeth started the first kindergarten for black children in 1895. And I believe that she was the first woman in New York City allowed to teach while married. 
So why is she remembered? Well, 166 uh, years ago today, Elizabeth and her friend Sarah Adams took a, a Chatham Street horse car bound for church. When she refused to leave because they were black, the conductor assaulted her and threw her off. Undeterred, she re-entered the car and the conductor tossed her out again, aided by a city policeman. She sued and won a landmark hate case that opened all transit services to New Yorkers. And here we have a, a lithograph of the, the corner where the altercation began, the Chatham and Pearl Streets, where Elizabeth and Sarah tried to get on horse car number six. So the question I asked myself when I started this project is what drove battered Elizabeth Jennings to get off the ground and charge back onto that horse car? And it took me 12 years and 256 pages to figure out that the answer lay, as Frederick Douglass said, in her good New York stock of strong family values. And those family values really start with her, with her father, Thomas Jennings. In the early 19, 1820s, he was Elizabeth, uh, he owned one of the largest tailoring houses in the city. He began experimenting with chemicals to clean fabrics, and in 1821 was granted a U.S. patent for the process of dry scouring clothes. In essence, he invented an early version of dry cleaning and it revolutionized the clothing business. And if you look up at the uh, left-hand corner, you'll see what uh, the letters of patent looked like when they were awarded back in the 1820s. And over on the left side, you'll see uh, an announcement in one of the New York City newspapers that uh, this patent had been granted to him. And one of the interesting things is after he's granted the patent, I think he actually gets involved in one of the first cases of, of patent infringement when another tailor in the city named Abraham Cox was going around saying, hey, I have this great method of, of cleaning clothes and you should come to my shop. And um, he went around town tearing down uh, Jennings placards as they called advertisements at that time. And finally Jennings had it with him and he moves his shop right next to Cox's on Nassau Street. And these guys are going back at it, back and forth uh, all summer and, and fall. Finally, uh, Cox vandalizes Jennings' uh, store by throwing acid all over his ornate glass signs. And Jennings drags him into court in uh, downtown Manhattan on November 29th, 1821, and, and charged him with trying to monopolize the, the, the great clothing business. And um, at the pivotal point, point of the trial, Jennings stands up and holds his letters of patent and says, look, this is my invention. I own the patent. It's signed by John Quincy Adams. From that point on, the, the all-white male jury goes off. They find unanimously for Jennings, and they give him $50, a lot of money in 1821. And to me, that really epitomizes and I think sets the tone for the family to say, look, we're citizens of this country. We are covered by, by the legal rights of this country, and we will pursue them when we have to. And likewise, on her mother's side, uh, Elizabeth learned about activism in a, in a different way, because women were not allowed to partake in public life. So for instance, if they wanted to raise money for charities, they had to give it to a male-run organization because they really knew how to spend it, right? So, um, so women start these literary societies, both uh, black women and, and groups of white women. And in these literary societies, they read books. And in some cases, they learn to read because they're not allowed to go to school either very often. And uh, also learn to write and then really how to present arguments and write essays about uh, issues of the times. So it's really the beginning of the feminist movement in my eyes that ends up leading to uh, Seneca Falls in 1848, the women's vote into what's going on today. And one of the first ways they get actively involved, in, well not actively involved, but they get involved in politics are these, if you look in the center, these petitions. And they were to, uh, people. they wanted to get people to sign to, um, stop slavery in the nation's capital. And by the mid 1830s, from all these literary societies and other groups, millions of these uh, petitions end up, in, end up in Congress and Congress bans them. They say enough, we're not taking any more of these pet petitions. But women now are finding a way to find their voices and have their voices heard. And one of the voices that gets heard through uh, the group that Elizabeth's mother and, and six other women start is the woman you see right here, uh, her picture alone, her name is Maria Stewart. She's the first woman to ever give a public speech in America. And she reads from her uh, book, Meditations, that you see here, that if you read it today, you may say, well, that, that's kind of uh, what we expect. But back then, saying that women should vote and women should be able to work and do all these things that men, it was absolutely scandalous 
and she was up in Boston and sort of gets banned in Boston and comes down to Manhattan and becomes a school teacher and joins their literary society. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Elizabeth and a number of the daughters of the other founders all became teachers and activists in their own right. And in 1837, uh, uh, the group celebrates their, their fourth anniversary by ho holding a mental feast for the colored American, to raise money for the colored American newspaper. And they invite men in, of course, they're in a cordoned off area because if men and women were to intermingle during a meeting, it would be considered very promiscuous. So uh, the, the men showed up, they raised money for that. They also raised money for helping to free slaves and two people coming through the Underground Railroad uh, a, a year later, who I think got, got their uh, financial assistance are Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass and Anna Douglass. And I don't think that's something that Digla Douglass ever forgot. So now I'm gonna move up uh, 350 miles north to the Can uh, Canadian, Vermont, uh, New York border where uh, uh, William Arthur immigrates from Ireland. Now he's of Scottish descent, but he comes to uh, uh, the Quebec area to um, become a teacher. He has hopes on being a lawyer, but instead he meets Malvernia Stone in Vermont and they elope and uh, along the way he decides uh, that he needs to be a preacher and an ardent abolitionist at that. So his family, uh, uh, abolitionists weren't the favorite people of the hard scrabble farmers upstate and in uh, Vermont. So uh, his family was always very poor. And if you see the building uh, up at the top, the yellow building, that one room is where uh, Chester Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont. And where his family really hits their stride though is when they get to Union City, today it's known as Greenwich, New York. Uh, the original, uh, originally they called it Whipple City after the guy who founded it. but in Union City, his father meets all these abolitionists, the, the, the top names. He meets Erasmus Culver. He meets uh, Garrett Smith, the Tappan brothers. Uh, a lot of them come in to preach and talk to his, um, to his, uh, his uh, pastorage. And although Arthur is schooled at home mostly by his father, by the time he goes to high school, he needs to get a, a public record so he can go to Union College. And that's the academy he went to. And one other little uh, interesting note about Greenwich, New York, this other house you see here is where Susan B. Anthony lived. So she taught there. I think her and Arthur just miss each other, but I thought it was very interesting that two iconic uh, figures from 19th century American history were together uh, come, you know, in this little village in upstate New York. So if you came to New York in, in you know, the 1850s, what would, what would you see? What was life like in the big city? Well, if you look at the far end of the map, this is from around 1850. And you can see everybody's lives just down as a little triangle, what we call Lower Manhattan. I mean, this is well below um, where City Hall is today. And the, the population at that time is already over, over a half a million people. So New York is already the largest city in, in the country. And it's probably third or fourth in the world. But it's still a little cow town. I mean, and literally there are cows, uh, uh, all kinds of livestock that you need to live, chickens, uh, all the, they're all running around the streets. And you look at the far bottom there, there are 20,000, if you can believe this, and I didn't believe it until I read it, 20,000 feral pigs running around lower Manhattan streets, knocking people over, um, uh, stopping traffic. I know when, when Dickens came here, he was just astonished by the, the number of pigs on the street. But by 1850, when New York is trying to become more of an international uh, uh, city, the policemen have these drives where they drive out these, these 20,000 pigs up into the Bronx, kind of like St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. And the city starts to uh, really put some money and thought into their public services. And one of them was starting a board of health. And I came across these, uh, these maps, they, they were called stench maps that, this is before people knew about germs. And they, they said that, um, Odors was what caused disease. So they hired a lot of people with good noses to go out and smell around the city. And they all decided that all the bad odors were coming from Brooklyn. So they um, um, were all the, the tanneries and the slaughterhouses and the gas works were. So these odors were drifting over and they, they would, would track them. Um, and of course you can't really talk about uh, New York at this time, unless you mention the infamous five points, the, the painting you see up at the, the right corner uh, if you saw the gangs in New York, that's, that's where all that happened. That's where all the, 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 the great stories come from. And Davy Crockett, when he visited here, said, I'd rather get an Indian fight than walk through there at night. 
So if you came to the city as, as a, as a uh, tourist back then, what would you see? Well, on the far left, this is Broadway. And Broadway looks kind of, oh, well, lower buildings, but Broadway is Broadway, right? And the building you see there with the spire, that's Trinity Church. It's, I believe, 265 feet high. That was the highest point in the city. So if you were walking around, that was always your point of reference where you could find yourself wherever you were compared to the spire. But if you stop somebody on the street and say, well, what should I see in this little old town? You, they would say, oh, you gotta go to Barnum's American Museum. And that's the picture here in the middle. A five-story building, very unusual at the time, took up a whole city block. He had the flags of the world flying on top of his building and a massive American flag that you'd see from out, at, out on the ocean. And he had acts like Chan and Ng's uh, uh, conjoined twins, little person General Tom Thumb, the Fuji mermaid, he even had a, a whale in a, in a tank for people to ooh and ah at. 400,000 people come to his uh, museum on Ann Street and uh, uh, they ooh and nod. And if you were lucky, you got to stay in the Astor Hotel, this building in the, far, in the bottom uh, left, another five-story building, nine, uh, excuse me, 309 rooms and a whopping 17 bathrooms to serve people with water that is pumped by steam engines in the basement. And a lot of famous people stayed there. Lincoln stayed there. Our friend uh, Davy Crockett. Uh, Charles Dickens on his many trips stayed there. And in fact, when Dickens visit the, visits the building at the top right hand, the Halls of Justice, otherwise known as the Tombs Prison, he calls it a pile of bastard Egyptian. And um, of course, you can't be an international uh, city unless you have a first class opera house. And the building you see here is known as Tripler Hall. Uh, it was built in around the, uh, the, the mid-1850s, and uh, it sat about 5,500 5, people. Today, it's known as the Winter Garden Theater. And it was, they say it was built for this woman in the bottom here. Her name was Jenny Lynn. She was known as the Swedish Nightingale. And when she opens the building, people pay an unbelievable $3 a seat to hear her sing. And this other woman you see here, her name is Elizabeth Greenfield. Uh, she was an ex-slave known as the Black Swan. She sang before all the courts in Europe. And she came back here and she sang in Tripler Hall. But the thing is, when she sang, she only sang to white audiences. And the thing that ties all these places together is they're all segregated. African-Americans are not allowed to take part in any of the social or cultural activities of the, of the city. They can't ride this, the, the uh, horse cars. They can't take ferries. They can't take steamships or, 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 or railroads. New York is probably one of the most, if not the most segregated city in the country. And again, you can't talk about New York at this time without talking about its complicity in the slave trade. Now you would say, well, wait a second, wasn't, wasn't slavery outlawed in, in New York in 1827? And that's true. But the city's finances were what kept the slave trade uh, alive in, in the States. They, they uh, put them, their money, the, the bankers' money behind uh, the plantations. They helped purchase the slaves. They insured the slaves. They insured the slave ships that were out there to the point when uh, the mayor, Fernando Wood, says the profits, the luxuries, the necessities, nay, the physical existence of the city depends upon the continuance of slave labor and the prosperity of the slave master. New York City was all in on the slave trade to the point when uh, the Confederate states start to form and, and separate. He says we should secede with, with them and blockade the Union and the city board, board of aldermen say, yeah, you're right. So uh, slavery was, we were complicit. And just a, another couple of little facts. The ship you see here is, was owned by the uh, fellow. He was, he was actually quite proud to be known as the Prince of Slavers. His name was Frank Bowden. And he named this ship the Nightingale after Jenny Lynn, and he put a bust of her on the front of it. That she was so outraged and horrified when she found out about it, she condemned it. She, I don't think she ever came back to New York after hearing that. But that is um, uh, what the slave trade brought. And it was only just trading financially for slaves. As you can see from this one sign, slave hunters were all over New York City. They had a group called themselves the New York Kidnappers Club, and they just literally kidnap people off the streets. It didn't matter whether they were actually slaves on the run or just normal citizens. Just like if you saw 12 Years a Slave or read the book, that wasn't a unique thing. That happened all the time. They said, there were, oh, maybe over a hundred, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of free African-Americans were kidnapped and put into slavery that way. So you can imagine 
if you're Elizabeth Jennings or anybody, if you were, you would never walk alone on a street. It was just because this could happen. And finally, here's a view of the South Street Seaport and that they called uh, South Street the city, uh, the, the street of ships and those slave ships left there every day, almost at free will. They would load up uh, inventory of hat boxes, but if you open the hat boxes, you found shackles inside that were used to enslave people and bring them to plantations down south. So now we're at the point where really we're seeing, um, uh, uh, you know, Elizabeth's uh, uh, altercation. And again, just to set the tone a little on that, that day, uh, that Sunday was uh, the end of a long, week, week long heat wave, the kind of, you know, we get in the middle of, we're all familiar within the summer, except we have air conditioning. Uh, it was over 100 degrees all week. Um, uh, they had to close down the, the shipyards, all, you know, hard labor had to stop. People were dying, uh, uh, passing out, having brain fever, as they called it at the time, horses dying in the street. But Elizabeth had to go to church that day. So she put on her seven, seven layers of petticoats and gets ready to uh, go over and play the organ and lead the choir. And these beautiful murals you see, I think uh, really depict uh, graphically the, the story. And they, they were made uh, by uh, artist Susan Ortega. And they, they were very large murals, uh, four or five feet wide. And they were made for an educational program for school students to learn about Elizabeth and uh, the civil rights movements in the, in the 50s. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they were stored in the World Trade Center and they were destroyed in 9-11 before the program could ever happen. But I wanted to uh, let everybody see how, how beautiful they are and the, the way they depict her story. And in the center here is another view of, Ch uh, of uh, Chatham Street where their horse car was supposed to take them to church. Now, uh, the thing, you know, when you say, well, Elizabeth was thrown off a, a horse car, she wasn't just pushed out. She was violently pulled out. I mean, she was beaten and thrown, not just, you know, a step off. You're talking about, you know, it was probably a four foot drop. I mean, so she's really hurt badly. And she limps home alone. Uh, and uh, after the cop warned her, never, if you say anything, we're going to come after you. And uh, uh, she gets home. She can't even write uh, a letter because people are, the community is outraged. And they say, Monday night, we're going to have a meeting at, at the church she's supposed to go to. She has a father write a letter that explains th what happened to her. And so he brings it to the to the um, to the church the next day, and says, "All right, people, what do we want to do?" So they want three things. First of all, they want the Third Avenue Railroad to apologize for brutalizing one of their most promising young uh, professional uh, workers. The second thing is they want them to pay restitution for damn it for beating up Elizabeth. I mean, it shouldn't have never happened. And third, and the thing her father considered most important is that they should recognize the right that African-Americans can ride any form of transportation they want in the city. They are, they are citizens like everybody else. There's no reason why they should be kept off and beaten for trying just to, to take a ride. And he doesn't um, just hire a lawyer and say, okay, let's, let's try to get some money out of this case. No, he goes out and he hires the best law firm in the city that deals with these type of civil rights issues Culver, Parker, and Arthur. Arthur being young Chester Arthur, just having passed the bar two months before, he, um, this is going to be his first case. And the thing that he does that, that, that really helps it out is he moves it from the home field of the Third Avenue, powerful Third Avenue Railroad that was made a million dollars in 1854. And he moves it to Brooklyn City Hall because Brooklyn was a few, uh, separate city back then. And, they, and he moves it to the Supreme Court and there, um, uh, on February 22nd, 1855, and of course, everybody knows February 22nd is George Washington's birthday, a much bigger holiday than it is today. It wasn't just sales. I mean, there were, so there were parade goers in, in, in the uh, city hall, fife and drum bands. It was just crowds of people. So the, the rafters where the trial took place were packed. And uh, by all rights, everybody said, oh my God, why is this woman even trying? She's not gonna win. This, this railroad's way too powerful. And, and it's kind of like almost waiting for, a, we might call a car wreck. So uh, the two, uh, the conductor and the driver both plead no contest. They say, yeah, we did it, sorry. And the railroad 
lawyers stand up and say, well, look, uh, these men have free will. We have no control over them. Uh, we should just have these charges dismissed and everybody go home. And the judge is inclined to uh, go along with that until Arthur holds up this statues from New York State statues from 1824 and says, wait, uh, public conveyances are liable for the actions of their employees, whether or not they're intentional or not, they're liable. And the judge starts to read these, um, this, this statute, and then he gives orders to the jury, the all white male jury, and uh, they go off and deliberate. They come back rather quickly and they find unanimously for, for, for Elizabeth. She's asked for $500, I give it 225, the judge throws in another 25 for Arthur to pay for his, his salary. And the audience, I mean, it was like, uh, from everything I read, uh, uh, you know, the winning run from the World Series, people were, were shouting and, and, and ecstatic. Uh, Horace Greeley, the editor of the Tribune is told what happens. He hurriedly writes his own headline, A Wholesome Verdict. And he writes a story uh, uh, gleefully about the, 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 the verdict. And um, everyone is stunned that this happened. And at that point, many of the other railroads in the city capitulate and say, yeah, we will let, we'll, we'll all let people uh, ride our things. Um, and from that point on, after, after the trial, both Elizabeth and uh, Arthur are kind of uh, celebrities. Arthur goes on to a political career. He goes up to Albany and works on the Lemon Slave uh, case uh, appeal. Elizabeth goes back to being a teacher, but she's also kind of a, a rock star of her day. She uh, starts to appear at uh, charitable events playing the organ. And I remember seeing a couple of ads saying, uh, you know, come to the Young Men's Christian Association and hear Elizabeth Jennings play for 12 and a half cents a, uh, uh, a ticket. So, uh, so they, they uh, move on with their lives. Uh, ironically, they both uh, get married uh, within a year of each other. Um, they both marry spouses eight years younger than each other. They both have sons of almost about the same time, about the same age. And unfortunately, both of their sons die within days of each other during, during the draft riots. So, um, and T Courtney told you a lot about the, the family life. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that, but uh, I will say, you know, she talked about the, um, the uh, Colored Orphans Asylum. This is the, the asylum up on 130, uh, 143rd Street. Uh, the one that was originally at um, around Midtown was destroyed during the draft riot. So this is where um, uh, the Wright family would have stayed. And Elizabeth, uh, I saw the records where uh, uh, the children would get sick. I think a couple of them had smallpox. She would take them out. They would get better. They would go back. And when they were 12, as she said, they were all taken um, out and under her wing, part of her family. And I would just like to talk about uh, one of them who really, who really stood out. And I think uh, 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 Edward Wright uh, Jr. was kind of the epitome of, if you read uh, her, her father's speeches like I have, one of the things he always said, you know, we need a, a leader in our community who's going to galvanize our, 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 our votes and get things that our community needs. And uh, Edward Wright Jr. was that. He kind of followed in his surrogate mother's, and I'll just call her his, his, his mom, uh, Elizabeth's uh, uh, footsteps and becomes a teacher. He graduates from the city college at age 17. So he's teaching in Jersey schools. But by 1884, uh, he's yearning to do something else. So ironically, he actually goes out to the um, Chicago where the, the um, Republican presidential convention is taking place. And Arthur is trying to run for a second term. He loses, but Wright comes out of that convention saying, this is, I now know what I want to do. I want to be get involved in politics. He becomes a lawyer. He passes the bar in, uh, I think, 1896. And some of his clients include um, uh, Jack Johnson, the boxer, if you saw The Great White Hope, uh, Ida Wells, who was a crusading journalist who uh, documented all the lynchings that were going on and called people out on them. And um, I think his, his proudest moment was during the 1919 uh, race riots where uh, he made sure that every black person accused of a crime had a pro bono lawyer and also got restitution for many, many of them for where their homes were destroyed. And, uh, if he, uh, and if, um, even to this day, they have, they now have an award, the, the uh, Edward Wright, uh, junior, uh, uh, community service award is still given out by the, by the, the Chicago board, um, uh, uh, lawyers.
So now we're, now we're at a, a, a point where uh, uh, we're getting toward the end of the story. Arthur, as, as you know, became president after uh, Garfield was shot. He returns to New York to open the Brooklyn Bridge. I think that's the highlight of his, um, uh, of, of his uh, the time in office. And uh, shortly uh, after that, he didn't get the nomination and he dies in 1886. Right before he dies, he, he, uh, he was very sick, but he kind of bounces back and he asks his son and a friend to help him burn all his papers. And I always wondered how much of Elizabeth's old papers and, and things from that time period may have been burned in, in those fires. And right after he does that, he dies two days later and he's buried in the Royal Cemetery up in, up in Albany. Elizabeth continues to leave a life. She's, she's an activist uh, throughout, she's doing a lot of church uh, work. Uh, she assists um, uh, another young journalist named Timothy Thomas, uh, Timothy Thomas Fortune, who uh, has a discrimination case. Uh, I think she lends him money and, and uh, uh, help, helps him, him win that. And then in 1895, uh, uh, she decides that, you know, uh, we really need to have, our children need to love learning as much as white children. And uh, she offers her home. She offers the, uh, she lives in a three-story house. She says, our families can live in the first, the top two. Why don't you guys take the, um, the, the first floor in the backyard for, for where kids can play and make that into a kindergarten? And I'll tell you, from the things I read, it was more than a kindergarten. It was really a community center because she offered uh, sewing classes on the weekends, uh, things on bookkeeping. They had a, a lending library they called the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Jennings Graham a Lending Library, where anybody could come in and borrow books and read. So, and it lasted well uh, beyond, uh, she dies in 1901, and it, I think it was going almost until the 1920s. And when she dies in, on June 5th, uh, 1901, after that she's forgotten for quite a while, but when the African Burial Ground Educational Units come along, it kind of reignites uh, her story and in 2007, uh, children from uh, one of the city schools uh, talked the city into uh, renaming Park Row Elizabeth Jennings Place. In 2015, her father is put into the Inventors Hall, National Inventors Hall of Fame in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. And in 2022, she'll have a statue uh, by uh, um, Grand Central Station, which isn't far from, from uh, Madison Square Park where Arthur's statue stands. So, that's pretty much it. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. As long as they're not about PowerPoint. <laughs> I'm going to I don't know get us all back on the screen here. Hold on just one second. Um, let's see. Hmm. No, I don't think so. Uh, okay, let me give, uh, let me try once more. Hold on. Okay. I think we're all, all back on the screen. Um, okay. Uh, first question uh, that we got has to do with the Jennings uh, Monument. Uh, that you just, you had mentioned just a minute ago, Jerry, that's mm -hmm. uh, scheduled to be put up in, uh, park next to Grand Central. Uh, and the question had to do with, uh, would it be more appropriate for the statue to be closer to uh, where the incident took place downtown, as opposed to Grand Central Station? And um, I'm not personally familiar with the details of the placement, but I guess there's uh, a bit of a, a controversy or a question as to whether its location in the park is as prominent as it should be. Uh, and um, I don't know, Courtney. Have have you have you been involved in that at all? I haven't been involved in that, but um, yeah, I'm certainly interested in learning more. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem with well, you, you saw the uh, the street sign. There's really not a lot of room there to put uh, the statue. It's, it's kind of it's it's kind of a little odd area, a lot of traffic moving around. So I, I think actually don't think it's a, such a bad idea to keep it where it is. It's going to be on, I think the concourse on where Vanderbilt Avenue is. I'm not exactly sure where. Um, yeah, the person who asked the question forwarded a link uh, to what's going on. So I can afford it uh, to you guys later. And, uh, you know, you guys can take a look at it. 
Um, somebody asked if it's true whether uh, there were laws that were banning pigs and cows from buses and then later subways. Seems like a reasonable law to me, but I guess they're on air yeah. out on airplanes now. So if they're allowed on airplanes, they should be allowed on buses mm -hmm. in some ways. <laughs> I, I don't know. The pictures I saw, some of, some of the pigs from back then, I don't think they even would fit on a horse car back in those days. Uh, <laughs> uh, today, I, I, I don't know uh, what the animal laws exactly are on the subways, but uh, I don't know if yeah. that helps. And um, there was one person who asked for some clarification whether four, four um, orphans initially. Courtney, can you, can you review that again? Yeah, I think, um, and I believe this might be in the book, um, but there were four. There's um, Desiderata Edward Wright, who um, Jerry spoke about. Um, Desiderata was my great-great-grandmother, uh, Ezra, Edward, and Esther. Ezra is the fourth. He did not go live with Elizabeth Jennings, and that was his choice. I believe he went to go live with friends. Um, he just took another path. Um, so the other three were together, but they stayed in touch, and they were actually staying in touch with their relatives in Mexico as well until well into um, the 40s, or I, I believe the 40s, there was, a, there was an earthquake in Mexico, and so they lost touch with the four older siblings who'd stayed there. But um, when I talked to older relatives, one of whom I think joined the call, they were saying that they were corresponding. So, the, I mean, the family's still very close. They just didn't all stay with Elizabeth Jennings. And uh, where's Elizabeth uh, buried? Cypress Hills mm -hmm. Cemetery. And, and they haven't, it's, it's uh, that, it's now, uh, it's almost like sort of a, a, a site to visit. So they have, they have things out there now that, um, and the whole family is there. The whole family, just like Arthur's family is up in, in the rural cemetery in Albany. Hers is all at, at Cypress Hills. Okay, uh, this one I believe is for Jerry, uh, coming from Courtney's cousin. Uh, what interested you in this subject matter? Well, uh, well, as I've, I've told the story a couple of times, um, you know, I was researching something else when I came, uh, in, in, I came across this story and thinking that I knew a lot about New York history, I'm like, how do I not know about this? And it's, this is, sounds really interesting. And uh, I remember thinking that I would, okay, I'll, I'm gonna look into this and see what, what comes up. And when I hit a dead end, I'll just you know, move on to something else. The thing is, I never hit a dead end. Uh, you know, when I thought, well, it, all right, so she was on this, this horse car and the thing happened, but then I find out, you know, her father was the, had the patent and was, was an abolitionist. Then her mothers did this. Her brothers did a lot of things that we really didn't talk about today. Um, and then you get on the, the, the side, the, the inter, uh, interaction with Arthur and, and all that. It's really a cross cut of American history. So it was just really interesting. And I'm sure there's more stuff. I mean, I'm not saying I got everything. I probably got I don't know, maybe 60 is 65 percent of what's out there. And, and I'm sure one day somebody's going to open a, a, a case in an attic and find a bunch of other things that'll uh, add further add to this story. So that's how I got uh, involved. In it. And I just thought that, you know, it, it was a story that needed to be told. And uh, a lot of times I would tell people and I get kind of a quizzical look. But afterwards, they would they would then come back to me and say, you know, that really is interesting. What else? You know, what else can you tell me? So that's it, it's a story that grows on you because she's an a, an average person trying to get about her life, but willing also to stand up for her rights. And I think that really creates a lot of empathy with people. And then uh, the last question we have. Oh no, now it's now it's not the last question. Second to last question: uh, Are you selling signed copies of the book? Oh, I'm always willing if I'm. If, we can find a way to socially distance the uh yeah i'm willing should they contact uh should people contact you jerry directly i'm uh, sure if they want to they can go to my website if the information's there i think okay and uh have you been approached to do a film on this family it would be good somebody asked which is actually i think i, I hope that's scorsese asking the question um <laughs> Yeah, it is actually. Oh, oh no, no, I misread that. Yeah. Uh, I, I have also heard that from a lot of people. They're like, 
you know, this is, this is, this sounds like a, a movie. And I think so too, but uh, so far, no. Okay. Fingers crossed, you know, if you're out there. So someone asked about the website. It's uh, jerrymicorenda.com slash books. You can see on the bottom of your screen now. Yeah. And they can buy books directly from you. Uh, well, that, that'll lead them to the, to, uh, I guess, Amazon and a couple of the other websites. Oh, okay. But if they want a signed copy? Uh, yeah. Maybe they should just contact you and then. Yeah, they can contact there. me. Yeah. My email's on there too, so. Okay. So that's it for the questions. Um, if people, uh, just to let you know our poll uh, results, so about 40 percent of the people are from uh, New York City, but not in the Lower East Side, about 25% um, within the Lower East Side, about 10% in the tri-state area, 15% in the United States outside the tri-state area, and actually two people from outside the United States, which is, which is nice to see. Wow. And um, so, Thank you so much, uh, Jerry and, and Courtney. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, a video of this event will be put on uh, Lesby's YouTube channel. And uh, Jerry, can you put on that last slide? So people can see the uh, sure. website ad address. Yeah, uh, you can access our, our YouTube channel through our website homepage at uh, www.lesby-nyc.org. If you're not already on our email list, you can also sign up for uh, our occasional emails, uh, including our newsletters and sometimes some call to action, calls for action for uh, preservation purposes. And um, our next uh, Lesby webinar is on July 29th on the carved stone architectural st uh, ornament of New York City uh, and the Lower East Side. And this we followed on August 6th by a, a webinar on Rose Schneiderman, Women's Suffrage in the Lower East Side. And note that August marks the 100th uh, anniversary of the signing of the 17th uh, Amendment uh, for Women's Suffrage. Uh, and we'll be sending out invitations by email shortly, so please uh, keep your eyes open for them. Uh, also, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution to Lesby. Um, you can find the donate button on our website's homepage, uh, again, lesby-nyc.org, or on the invitation to this event. And we rely on your donations to keep our programming, such as tonight's webinar and our upcoming webinars uh, going, as well as keep our preservation advocacy work going as well. So uh, again, I wanna thank everybody on behalf of Lesby and Bowery Alliance of Neighbors and uh, please uh, stay safe. Have a good evening.